Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are. There was just two guys that uh, looked at me like I was a big pork chop that had just landed on their plate. And they said, they said to me in Spanish, they said, are you here alone and unarmed? There was about five years of my life where I didn't have an address and was just get, getting around the American West and going down into Mexico by various different means, lived in my car a lot, prevailed on the hospitality of strangers a lot. I spent quite a lot of my life in dangerous situations. It wasn't exactly a plan of mine, but um, I remember I, went, I got assigned by a magazine to cover Snoop Dogg's murder trial <laughs> in, in L.A. This was, what, back in the 90s, I guess? And, and I had to perform kind of a sales act on my girlfriend. I said, listen, I know this sounds crazy, but I think we need to leave the throbbing heart of downtown Manhattan and move to Pluto, Mississippi, <laughs> population seven. <laughs> A 40-minute drive from the nearest grocery store uh, in a state where you've never been before and have heard many bad things about. And I remember one time getting... I basically got forced into doing a bunch of cocaine with three police officers in a, in a, in a cantina. <laughs> uh, and they were trying to sell me drugs. They thought, well, if a, if a, if a gringo is down here in the Sierra Madre, he must be here to buy drugs. So these, But for me, it was... It, it worked really well. I was very happy in my 20s and 30s, just as a restless, rootless, wandering male without any obligations. I never had any money. I was always flat broke. But I had a lot of personal freedom, and that was my goal in life. And so I was satisfied. Satisfied. What's up, folks? Xavier Katana here, and you are listening to the Human Experience Podcast. Our guest for today is Mr. Richard Grant. Richard is a journalist and author whose interest in exploration and wandering has taken him on a number of riveting travel adventures. This was a phenomenal episode to do. Richard has traveled, like I said, extensively all through the United States, and we covered some of the stories that he had to share american nomads is the book and you are going to love this episode here is mr richard grant the human experience is in session my guest for today is mr richard grant richard it's a pleasure to have you here sir welcome to hxp glad to be here Richard, I, I've fallen in love with your work. I, I know you've written a bunch of books, but for the people that don't know who you are, can you just give us a, a short, brief introduction to what you do, please? Well, I'm a journalist and an author and a very occasional documentary uh, film presenter. I made a documentary for the BBC called American Nomads, which was about all the different nomadic subcultures in North America, past and present. I've um, done another another few TV things, but mainly I write books and magazine stories. Yeah, that's that's how I found you, is by watching your documentary, and then I got into your book, and it, it's such an amazing writing style. I mean, you, you certainly have a way with the pen. I mean, it is, it is a sword or, or something there for you. Well, it's it's been my sole source of sustenance for the last 25 years. So, you know, I have a right to eat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we're talking about nomads today. I, I mean, how do we define what a nomad is? Well, for me, a nomad is someone who doesn't feel stable when they're stationary. They feel a sense of stability and comfort when they're moving, when they're on a journey. Um, and that could apply to, you know, some guy in Africa herding goats on foot that could apply to a hobo riding a freight train across America right now that could apply to somebody following a herd of cattle on a horse. Um, 
Nomads have a different understanding of what, what a destination is. A destination is just a pause in the journey. Uh, they never really arrive in a place with the same mindset as somebody who's not a nomad. Um, they don't attach much importance to the idea of home. Uh, the, the road is, is the home. And I would also say that nomads have a particular idea about what freedom is. Um, you know, we talk a lot about freedom in, in this country and we think it has to do with, you know, liberal democracy, the right to vote, the rule of law, uh, that kind of stuff. But nomads have a completely different idea of what freedom is. For, for a nomad, freedom is all to do with mobility and open space and the, the ability to travel unfettered and often ungoverned. Nomads... Ha- do not tend to get on well with government. Hmm. And I was, I was, while I was researching for this conversation, I, I read an article about how 99% of our history has been lived as nomads. It's only in the last 1% of the time that we've been here on this planet that we've developed this idea of one place, this sedentary sort of lifestyle, as you say. I mean, how do you feel this has changed over time? Why do you think? This has changed over time so much. Well, you really got to look at the uh, the invention of agriculture. I mean, I forget the exact numbers, but you know, for the as you say, for the great majority of human history, we were kind of wandering hunter gatherers. You know, we'd hole up in a cave here, but you know, if if the game moved on, we'd we'd follow the game uh, that we needed to survive. And then once. once agriculture was invented, I think that was nine thousand years ago, but I'm not certain about that. You know, then there was a then there was a good reason to stay put. Your food was stationary; it wasn't wandering away on the hoof. Um, and really, sedentary society grew out of agriculture. Then you also what you had at this after we domesticated crops, we domesticated animals, and then you had what's called pastoral nomadism is in that, um, you know, there would be people that take the sheep and the cattle and the goats out to graze. And some of those people would just stop coming back to the, to the village. They would just be, become full ta- full time nomads with the livestock. So that was another form of nomadism. You know, some people say that we're hardwired for it. I don't, I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's certainly an argument that people make that we're, we're wired to be nomads and that sedentary living is a, is a recent experiment and that it's caused a lot of our social problems. Um, I'm not sure whether I go along with that, but I'm at least willing to listen to that argument. Hmm. Richard, let me just, I just want to check. I'm getting some dropped, dropped samples. Let me just make sure that the recording sounds good. Just I'm going to pause it right there. Okay. Hang on one second. And... So you talk about this, it's ingrained somewhere in our DNA that we are meant to be you know, nomadic, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's an argument that, you know, a lot of people have made that since we did spend so much of our evolutionary development on the move, that it's kind of encoded in us the desire to move and explore and see what's over the horizon. That's obviously, you know, how the world got peoples out of Africa was that desire to of people to move on and experience um, new landscapes and a lot of it just a lot of it historically just came came down to following animals that were trying to get away from us mm. yeah I mean you wrote an essay for Eon where you talked about the conflicts between nomads and the sedentary and and how this this conflict has played out on almost every continent why do you think the quote civilized have won where, you know, we're in this fixed position where we live. Okay. So let's just think about this, why, you know, this conflict between, between farmers and nomads, between city dwellers and nomads has has cropped up on, like like you say, every continent except Antarctica, which is more or less uninhabited. And it has, it has to do with conflicting philosophies of land use. You know, nomads want land to be, is there to, to, to be crossed, you know, grazing is there to be reached. Whereas the farmers and civilized people, they like fences, they like roads, they like taxes, they like boundaries, they like rectangles. Civilization comes over the land in a kind of a grid work. Hmm. Um, 
you know, people, our buildings have corners. Nomads prefer yurts and teepees that have round, and that don't have any corners. They prefer round shapes, and they want land to be smooth and to be able to be crossed easily. Um, that's the root of the conflict. I think the reason why nomads have lost this conflict is that civilization has proved more effective at generating technologies, at generating large populations. You know, nomads have to live in balance with the natural environment. If they start overloading it, the resource runs out. That you know, there's no more grass for the livestock, or you know, you overhunt the meat. If you get too many people, there's nothing to eat. So nomads live live in kind of a, a lean balance with the natural environment, hmm. whereas civilization found a way to increase its numbers. Um, you know, through living in cities, through practicing agriculture. Hmm. And and the other big thing is is literacy. That most nomads in human history have not been literate, and literacy as a way of storing knowledge is a much more effective system than oral history. Hmm. So that gave you know so the civilized had greater numbers, they had more technologically advanced armies, and they had this system of knowledge to draw on. You know, you mentioned technology, and I think this is an important part of it. I mean, it, it it seems that technology has helped us in many ways, but in other ways, it's really hindered our progress. I mean, we, with the advent of social media, we're so trapped on our phones. It feels like this auspicious sort of way we are trapped in, in this idea of using our cell phones to connect with others in this good-hearted way, but essentially we're we're not doing that in real life we're not connecting with people by looking at their face we're connecting with them through facebook updates and retweets and likes and you know so it's frustrating yeah i mean when when digital technology arrived and anyone that criticized it was called a luddite i don't think if you if you criticize social media and smartphones now you get called a luddite because i think awareness has now grown that this is this is a, a major issue. It, it's made us more connected, but those connections have become less valuable and less satisfying. What is the biggest nomadic group in the 21st century America? Numerically, the largest group of nomads that you're looking at in America today would be retirees living in motorhomes. I think there's a last, last I checked, there was a quarter million of them. And a lot of them have sold their houses and Put the money in their motorhome and they just live on the road year round maybe stop in and visit the grandkids but um i found it a really fascinating subculture partly because i'm from europe where grandparents do not do that hmm. <laughs> they do not sell their houses and take to the road i think it's a sort of manifestation of that wanderlust in the in the american tradition and they they tend to travel in 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 clubs or groups or or herds you could say <laughs> and um i remember seeing them in in the arizona desert in the winter there's a big congregation of them at a place called quartzsite arizona mm -hmm. and they were circling their motorhomes like 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 covered wagons on the prairie in in the 1860s and they'd have a campfire in the middle of the motorhomes and they would get together and kind of drink cocktails and tell stories and um, very happy people on the whole. It seemed to seem to be a very satisfying way of living to them. Why is there why is there this idea of the old West? Why does that appear in their lifestyle? I mean, I think it's that they're crossing the same landscape. Um, I think the idea of nomadic freedom is, you know, which is the thing that they're after is was a was a big feature of the, of the old west i mean both cowboys and indians were both horse nomads so i think i think they feel a part of that that nomadic tradition that was such a big part of things in the in the old west hmm. and you see um you know on their t-shirts they'll have sort of herds of buffalo or wild horses or symbols of freedom and mobility you know i i want to know why there is this sort of resurgence. I, I'm not sure if you've heard of this trend that's that's happening on social media. It's called van life. Have you heard of this? I, I mean, I've heard of it. I, I, I'm no expert on it, but tell me more. It's, I mean, it's this romanticized version of, of living in this really small van. Um, most of 
the pictures on Instagram show, you know, this really hot girl with this guy. You can see his abs. I mean, it's it's nothing like what you would expect someone living out of their van would be whatsoever. So, I mean, I mean, w- is there an element of fakery to it? At least on the, uh, for Instagram purposes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there is. I mean, I hate to say it, but yeah, it seems like a lot of it is orchestrated for that picture. I mean, it, they're not yeah. showing the parts where you have to pee in a bottle or you know poop in the woods. They're not. They're not yeah. displaying that part of it. I mean, there's a grimy aspect to living out of your car. But why do you think there is this romantic notion, this idea of, of this freedom aspect of being on the road? I mean, I think there is a genuine aspect of freedom there, and I think there's also, you know, it's 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 culturally imprinted on us as Americans, you know, through Jack Kerouac and Jack London and road movies, and um, you know, there's this there's this alternative to the to the rat race that exists in America. That in, in, you know, people people dream of living on the road, getting out into the wide open spaces. It's it's the kind of the other American dream, isn't it? There's there's the American dream with the white picket fence and and the and the two kids and sending them off to college and bettering the bettering the family over the generations. But there's also a kind of subversive American dream, which is you know burn down the house and saddle up the horse and um, get out on the road. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean now in today's culture, it seems like. You know, you're working your nine to five. By the time that you you get home, it, you're so exhausted. All you can do is watch TV. You know, maybe you throw something into the microwave. It's a dreary lifestyle. And I, I think now with this this idea of living in your van, at least you've paid or you're paying off something that you own. It's not being flushed away th- with rent. And it, I, I think more people are, are starting, starting to identify that the system is flawed. The current system is flawed. Well, it's just not very successful in producing satisfaction and happiness, the current system. So people look for alternatives. And, you know, you've, the idea of living in your van, sure, it's grimy and you have to pee in a bottle. And, and, and I know because I, I've done it. But you have a measure of freedom. It's not complete freedom, but it's more freedom than most people have. And you have independence. And you've got a, a feeling of adventure in your lives, which if the nine to five version does not provide adventure. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, unless you, unless you get into weird drugs. <laughs> How long did you spend sort of traveling and driving around, wandering around? There was about five years of my life where I didn't have an address and was just get, getting around the American West and going down into Mexico by various different means, lived in my car a lot, prevailed on the hospitality of strangers a lot. And then it finally became inconvenient because I was starting to, I was starting to write stories for magazines and I needed a bank to catch the checks. To get a bank account, I needed an address. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I rented a little um, $300 a month uh, kind of cottage thing in Tucson, Arizona. And I used that as a, as a base. But I basically, you know, I wasn't there. I, I think in, for the next 10 years, I never spent more than three consecutive weeks at home. Wow. I, was, I would go home, I would write a story, and then I would get back in my vehicle and go off to the you know, it wasn't always for stories. Sometimes it was for, let's go and have a look at Montana, or I wonder how so-and-so is doing in San Francisco. I was just very restless in that phase of my life. Hmm. Still am, you know, but I'm trying to settle down now. <laughs> is there a location that, that drew you to it that maybe you found yourself going back to more than once? I'm in lots and lots of different locations I uh, go back to. I mean, I'm living now in Mississippi, which is kind of an odd place for a guy from London, England to end up. Um, but I really think Mississippi is kind of one of the best kept secrets in America. It has this reputation for just being backwards and stuck in the, you know, stuck in the past and nothing much going on. But I've always had a, I've always had a really good time in Mississippi. And that's huh. somewhere I've always come back to. Um, in the Southwest, I lived. I sort of based myself in the Southwest for a long time. Uh, Montana, I go back to a lot. Um, I lived in. I lived in New York before I moved to Mississippi. 
And, you know, I love New York. I'm just, I just don't have enough money to live there. <laughs> yeah. Um, was there anywhere that, or any time in which you felt like, this is a dangerous situation that I'm in right now? I spent quite a lot of my life in dangerous situations. It wasn't exactly a plan of mine, but um, I remember I, went, I got assigned by a magazine to cover Snoop Dogg's murder trial <laughs> in, in L.A. This was, what, back in the 90s, I guess? And so I went down into his, into his neighborhood in Long Beach, you know, the sort of bottom of South Central there, and I just started asking around, you know, what did people think of Snoop in the trial? Then I found out that there was all these young guys who were trying to get out of their gangs and into the rap business. And I ended up writing a story about those guys and spending about four weeks riding around up South Central LA with these gangsters who were trying to become rappers. So that was, you know, there was obviously moments of danger there, uh, but nothing happened, you know. People kept telling me how dangerous it was in South Central. And, you know, I saw some edgy moments but it it was it was okay and so then what happens is you build up this probably false sense of confidence um you know then i went to i did stories in haiti people said oh haiti's like really dangerous you know i went to haiti nothing bad happened found it really fascinating um i went to cover the zapatista uprising in southern mexico where everyone said oh you know don't go it's too dangerous i went you know nothing bad happened so you start to you start to when people warn you about going to dangerous places, you start to take their not take their warnings as seriously as you might because you've been in all these places that people have said, "Oh my God, sure. don't go there." Right. But um, then I was living in southern Arizona and I started hearing stories about the Sierra Madre Mountains in northern Mexico. Hmm. And what you've what you've got in the Sierra Madre is this kind of wild west that sits on America's back doorstep. You can drive down to the border and you can see this mountain range filling up the southern skyline. And the mountains go on for 900 miles. They're about 70 miles wide. There's only two paved roads. There's four canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon. Hmm. There are still Native American tribes living in caves and hunting with bows and arrows. There are still people prospecting for gold with mules. You know, I'm talking about in the, in the 21st century. Hmm. But the economy of the Sierra Madre is growing drugs, and it's a very violent, lawless place. And everyone kept telling me, well, you can't go up there. It's too dangerous. But because I had built up this sense of confidence, I decided to go into the Sierra Madre and try and travel the length of these mountains and write a book about it. And it turned out to be, uh, you know, very dangerous indeed. In what sense was it dangerous? Just traveling was difficult because when, where there's no law, you know, I mean, there were some, there were occasional police officers, but they were all working for the drug cartels. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember one time getting, I basically got forced into doing a bunch of cocaine with three police officers in a, in a, in a cantina. <laughs> uh, and they were trying to sell me drugs. They thought, well, if a, if, a, if a gringo is down here in the Sierra Madre, he must be here to buy drugs. So these three cops kept chopping out lines of cocaine and pretty much forcing me to snort them <laughs> and then telling me that they could get me great weed, they could get me good cocaine straight from Colombia, would come in on a small plane. I mean, that's that's kind of how... That was the extent of the law. So what happens in lawless places is that um, the, you, people have to vouch for you with their life, essentially. I mean, I got to know people at the northern end of the mountains, and they basically vouched for me. They said, look, this guy, I vouched for him with my life. He, he doesn't work for the DEA. He's not going to cause any problems. And they would kind of, they would kind of pass me down. To the, to the next valley, to the next village, and I would have a name of somebody to look up or I would be physically brought into the next village. And they say, okay, here's this guy. Take care of him. He's okay. But a lot of it was just the, the, the social instability because these, were, these had been just poor um, cattle ranchers, farmers. There was no electricity in a lot of these villages, mm-hmm. but they had money from drugs. And the thing that they chose to spend their money on 
was cocaine, alcohol, and AK forty sevens. That made for that made for a very volatile social mix. That's fascinating, man. I love it. I, I mean, I mean, cocaine is a hell of a drug. I know, and it's also like the the you know the the kind of Mexican machismo is particularly strong in that part of Mexico up in those mountains. So you've got you've got machismo, you've got like a river of booze you got cocaine and everybody's armed with ak-47s so things can things can go wrong in a hurry yeah for sure there several times i just had to sort of scramble out and hide and then so yeah i was talking about my system of travel here it's it's all personal introduction uh-huh. and it, it was working quite well for me i'd got about two-thirds of the way down through the mountain range and just, you know, my notebooks were just filling up with what I thought was really fascinating material. And then um, my kind of chain of human connections ran out and I came out of the mountains into the city of Durango and I saw a, uh, an advert for this new tourist resort that was up in the mountains. It said it said there were cabins, there were horses, there was swimming. And I, I thought to myself, well, I'll go up to this place which is obviously it's, it's safe to go as a tourist. And then I'll make some friends there and somebody will pass me down the mountain range to their cousin or introduce me to someone in the next valley. But I went up there and there was no tourist resort. There was just two guys that uh, looked at me like I was a big pork chop that had just landed on their plate. Mm-hmm. And they said, they said to me in Spanish, they said, are you here alone and unarmed? And I, and I, <laughs> And I said, yes. And they're like, why on earth would you be here alone and unarmed? And I said, because, you know, I'm no, I'm no threat to anybody. I, I said, well, what, what is there to be afraid of? And the, the guy says to me, I kill to police the trigger finger. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I'm, I'm in it now. And then he shook out some cocaine onto the palm of his hand and just gulped it down and chased <laughs> it down with a beer. Anyway, it was it was kind of a it was a long story and a long night, but they ended up. Have you have you seen that movie No Country for Old Men? Sure, yeah. You remember the scene where the two big trucks are chasing the guy? <laughs> right, yeah. That was me. They're chasing me in two trucks through these mountains at night. I was just I'd never been so terrified in my life, and I I learned something about fear that I never particularly wanted to know in the first place. But my body was functioning at its absolute peak i was just never felt so alert and athletic and terrified at the same time i kind of i was just it made me think of the way you know when it, it, like a like a deer that know, knows it's been hunted can execute these extraordinarily graceful bounds and achieve great speeds that was me i was that i was that hunted deer with these two trucks after me but uh, yeah very very frightening night and um I was in a pickup truck. They built a fire next to my truck and they stayed up most of the night and then eventually they passed out in their blankets and I had to sneak in the next morning and jump in my truck and turn on the ignition and kind of peel out of there. And that was, that was I, I've never been back to those mountains since I got out and I've never been back since. <laughs> I did, did, did get a book out of it called God's Middle Finger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, that's great. I mean, there's something amazing about the currency of a story and not having to hold up your phone and press the button to create a memory, you know, like actually being able to relay this experience that you have and, and remembering it. Well, it was a very vivid experience, let, let me tell you. And I also, I mean, I'm in the, you know, I, I write for a living, so I'm in the habit of carrying around a notebook with me. And, um, you know, I re- Anyone that anyone that you know travels in order to learn and experience the world. I mean, I would, I would, I would recommend that the old-fashioned notebook. I mean, I take some photographs as well, but to record, you know, conversations that you had, to record how you felt about things at the time you were there. Mm-hmm. A notebook is actually a, notebook a very, actually a very good, good tool very for that. Tool for that. Tool for that. Tool for that. We are going to take a small break for a message from our sponsors. What's up, guys? We are interrupting this broadcast to bring you the deal of a lifetime, Helix Sleep 
a spoiler alert, has changed the game on sleeping. So let's talk a little bit about sleep. Sleep is a basic human need, like eating, drinking, and breathing. Like these other needs, sleeping is a vital part of the foundation for good health and well-being throughout your lifetime. This is where Helix Mattresses comes in. Helix has built a sleep quiz that takes two minutes of your time to complete. They use the answers to match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Whether you're a side sleeper, hot sleeper, you like a plush bed or a firm bed, with Helix, there's no more guessing or confusion. Just go to helixsleep.com slash hxp, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights absolutely risk-free. Right now, Helix is offering up to $125 off of all mattress orders. That's right. Get up to $125 off of Helix Sleep dot com slash hxp that's the link you want to go to helixsleep.com slash hxp one of the people that you met that that really touched a soft spot in my heart was comfrey and he was the train traveler right yeah comfrey he rides the freight trains i'm not sure he's doing it anymore you know there's this whole new generation of kind of sort of punky vagabond kids that are riding around on the freight trains and he was he was one of those when he was he just turned 18 had kind of a tough home life like a lot of them and he was out on the rails and trying to protect himself trying to be tough but just a sweet sweet smart kid at the same time he was he was he was he was very touching Hmm. i'm still still in in intermittent contact with him Hmm. Yeah, he's up. He's last I heard, he was he was cowboying in Montana and uh, doing some kind of environmental activism, protesting the bison slaughter that happens outside Yellowstone every year. Do you think there's a certain time in your life where you you want to travel and learn as much as you can, and then maybe as you get older, you're like, oh well, you know, I'm gonna chill out now, maybe have some kids. I mean, that's how I did it. Um, I think there's a lot of maybe more pressure now on young people to get started on their career and start paying back their student loans and whatever else. But, you know, I emerged from college without any student loans and without any clear idea of what I wanted to do or, you know, who I wanted to be. You know, I went to, I grew up mainly in London, England, and I knew I didn't want to live in England and I knew I didn't want to work in an office and I knew I wanted to see the world or do some traveling so you know the the, the the travel came first and then I started writing stories about some of the things I was encountering and then I started selling some of those stories to magazines and became this kind of roving freelance journalist hmm. um, and you know frankly you know I've met lots of I've met lots of women that um, do it too but it, it is easier if you're male you do have like less less to worry about than if you're female but for me, it was it, it worked really well. I was very happy in my 20s and 30s, just as a restless, rootless, wandering male without any obligations. I never had any money. I was always flat broke. But I had a lot of personal freedom, and that was my goal in life. And so I was satisfied. Hmm. And, you know, now I'm, now I'm, uh, I'm going to be 55 next month, and I have a three-year-old daughter. And a, and a and a wife and a mortgage, hmm. and um, so I, I left it late. But it's been hard the transition when you're used to when you're used to that much freedom in your life, and suddenly you've 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 got a, a wife and a kid and a mortgage, and uh, an uncertain income stream. Sure, you know, I find it difficult to adjust. I mean, that'll change the narrative for you, right? Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean having a having a young child change, you know changes everything. And what did you do before you got married? What did you do if you fell in love on the road? Did you stay there with them or was it like a goodbye type scenario? Um different strategies. I had you know I had some girlfriends who were who were very understanding and I would, I would be gone and I would come back to them and I would spend some time with them and I would go and come back and go and come back. Those were those were sort of long-term relationships. 
I had this weird phase of my life where women who were engaged wanted to have one last fling with me. <laughs> okay. I'm not, it happened like five or six times. Women are about to get married and settle down, just wanted one more, you know, yeah. one more yeah. uh, brief romance. I've noticed that. Why, so, why does that happen? So I, I don't know. I was, I, was, I, was, I was that guy for a while. Huh. I mean, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I find that really interesting that... That will occur. I mean, have you traveled outside the States? And I know you were in Africa for a little while. Yeah, I've spent quite, I've, I've traveled quite extensively in Africa. I've been over there eight, eight or nine times in West and South Africa and a lot in East Africa and Kenya and Tanzania and Burundi and Rwanda and Congo and several other countries. Was it different? Was the 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 environment different or i mean did you did you feel that being nomadic was different when you were in africa well i, I the thing i would say about africa is that the, the first few times that i went there it was it was for magazine stories and i was you know i was met at the airport uh sort of taken away in a, in a land rover to some sort of lovely bush camp maybe just a tent but i was i was looked after and protected and a lot of those were kind of safari type things. You know, I, I did I did a story about a, a guy that was um, trying to train captive lions to get back into the wild. I did I did a, a dugout canoe trip down the Zambezi River. That was my first trip, and I was really scared of things like crocodiles and hippos. And but it turned out to be um, you know a fantastic trip that I that I loved, and that that was kind of what kept me going back to Africa. And if uh, I think that my, my fifth or sixth trip to Africa, I decided I wanted to make the first descent of this river in Tanzania called the Malagarasi, hmm. which means ri- ri- river of bad spirits. Because hmm. I love floating down rivers, and I found out there was a river that no one had ever gone down in a boat before. And I thought, well, I'll be that guy and write a book about it and have a, have a have an adventure, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, but to get to the river. You know, I had to I had to kind of get there under my own steam. There was no one to meet me at the airport, and I was traveling on the bus, and I was trying to find my own my own accommodations. And I realized that on those previous trips, I'd been inside the safari bubble, but I hadn't really been in Africa proper. I'd just been in this safari bubble where people were looking after me the whole time. Mm-hmm. And once you once you step out of that safari bubble into the rest of Africa, it seems it seems really different. I mean, it's a difficult place to travel. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of it is just the the heat, you know. Why is it called the River of Bad Spirits? You know what? I never found out that why it was called that. Um, nobody nobody seemed to know. Hmm. Okay. We 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 certainly had some bad experiences on the river. Is it like a cursed river or something? I, I'm assuming that that's what it what it what it meant that, that there was bad spirits on the river. Huh. Interesting. I mean, you wrote, I mean, you wrote a bunch. I mean, you wrote uh, Dispatches from Pluto, where uh, it covers your decision to move from New York City to Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, as you were saying. Uh, what were you feeling when you moved from New York? Why did you leave New York? So the plan, I was with my, my girlfriend, Mariah, who's now my wife. We... Uh, I, I, for the first time in my life, I finally had some money from that BBC documentary. Not a lot of money, but I said, let's let's take this money and just go live in New York for a year because it's the capital of the world and we both had good friends there. And, you know, I think New York's a great city. And um, when we arrived there, I had a commission from the New Yorker magazine. I had another documentary film in the works. I had a regular gig for a British magazine. I had another book project in the works. Within two weeks of arriving in New York, all those plans had collapsed. Um, my, my then girlfriend, she couldn't find a job doing anything. And we were living in this tiny little half underground apartment and our dog was depressed. And it's just, just New York basically just chewed us up, <laughs> just chewed us up and spat us out. You know what I mean? And then while we were there, um, I got invited to do a book conference in Mississippi, uh, where I'd been, you know, ten or eleven times, and, and, and always enjoyed it. And a friend of mine in Mississippi took me out for a picnic, 
at a place called Pluto, her family's farm out in the Delta. And she showed me this lovely old five bedroom farmhouse on nine acres of land next to a river with fruit trees and vegetable beds and views out over cotton fields. And she said, you could probably have this five bedroom house on nine acres for about $130,000. That's my dad's house and he's selling it. And, um, you know, they barely let you park in New York for that. (laughs) So, um, you know, then I then went back to New York. We were we were living in Manhattan on 20th Street and 8th Avenue, and I went and, and had to perform kind of a sales act on my girlfriend. I said, "Listen, I know this sounds crazy, but I think we need to leave the throbbing heart of downtown Manhattan and move to Pluto, Mississippi, <laughs> population seven, <laughs> a 40 minute drive from the nearest grocery store." Uh, in a state where you've never been before and have heard many bad things about. <laughs> right. and, and, and and to her credit, she said, well, um, things aren't going well for us in New York. I'll at least go and have a look at the place. And like I had, she fell in love with this beautiful old farmhouse and the location. And it then was probably as extreme a case of culture shock as I've had in all my travels was arriving in the Mississippi Delta not knowing anything really about how the how the culture worked how the landscape worked dealing with dealing with incredible quantities of snakes and um mosquitoes and swamps and um and, and a very uh complicated system of race relations mm-hmm. it really took us a couple of years just to figure out how race relations worked in that part of mississippi mm. Tell us more. What, what you had a lot there was you had racial prejudice coexisting with love between the races. And this was not an equation that I was used to. I'll give you an example. On Pluto, uh, you know, the, the basic, all, the, all the white people belonged to one family. And there had been a black family that had lived on this land for three generations and had worked for the white family. And they'd become very, very close. And in previous generations, the black family had named their children after whoever the matriarch and patriarch of the white family were. But now this process had gone into reverse, and the white family were now naming their children after the heads of the black family. Like My friend Martha named her son Joe after a black man named Joseph, who had basically been a kind of surrogate father to her own father. Mm-hmm. So these two families were very, very interlinked. And they wept together at each other's funerals, but they found it really hard to eat a meal together at the same table because the habit of segregation was so instilled. And, you know, even though there was this deep love and respect from the white people for these black individuals, they would also come out with racist generalizations about black people in general. Mm-hmm. There were all these different complexities and contradictions and nuances um, in the race relations there that took a lot of untangling. Hmm. Have you seen any changes in that since you've been there? No, it seems to be about the same. I mean, I'd, I would say that race relations in Mississippi are... are, are Probably about ninety percent better than they you know, than they were. I would say that nowhere else has really come so far in its race relations as Mississippi. But on the other hand, nowhere else had so far to go. And the place is is still completely obsessed with race. I would say I would. It's it's hard to make generalizations as well because there's different types of racism. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got your kind of N word using racial hatred, sure. but that tends to be more associated with poor white people. Um, and then you've got this kind of paternalistic racism, which is more associated with the kind of upper crust. And they, I would say that, you know, they, they have a lot of these close loving relationships with black people, but they're not equal. Mm-hmm. They, they're not necessarily looking at their black f- friend, even as, a, as an equal. They don't want their daughter to marry a black man. I mean, somebody put it to me, said, said, there's white people in Mississippi that would lay down their lives for, you know, the black person that they're close to, that they would take a bullet for the for the, for their closest black friend, mm-hmm. 
but they would also take a bullet to stop him marrying their daughter. Wow. It's just it's just a lot more complicated than than I was um, expecting because it wasn't the sort of racism I was used to from other places. Sure. Yeah, it, it does sound very complicated. I mean, Pluto sounds like a very isolated per- place, like in forty forty minutes away from just a grocery store. How, how did you deal with the isolation? Well, I mean, it sounds isolated, but I was in fact had a very rich social life because we got basically adopted by the family down the down the road hmm. there was a neighbor three miles the other way he would be we at his house a lot there was a lot of parties to go to and also you just you just start to think nothing and driving 40 minutes i mean i would drive i would drive 90 miles to go and play golf with morgan freeman he Morgan, I got to know Morgan Freeman. He lives in the, in the Mississippi Delta. He belonged to this crazy little uh, country club way out in the middle of nowhere where you're allowed to carry a chainsaw in your golf bag to cut down <laughs> trees that got in the way. And they'd turn the tennis courts into a dove field because they preferred hunting doves to playing tennis. Very eccentric little country club that Morgan loves. <laughs> So, yeah, 90 miles, drive 90 miles to go to a party, drive 90 miles to go to a juke joint. There's still a few of these little um, you know, kind of blues clubs left where you, I mean, they're on the way out now, but there's a few left and they they were really fun. And that was another place where it's a, it's a black club and you feel a little bit awkward when you first step in there, but... It was a kind of environment that that showed that black and white Mississippians actually know how to get along really, really well. Like when sometimes you get these kind of magical nights there, where the all the race stuff falls away and everyone just has the best time together. And then, but it doesn't kind of stick afterwards. That the, what you think is a friendship then tends to kind of slide apart, and the old habit of living separately reasserts itself. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I think I think. I mean, it's just such a complicated topic. I mean, I see race relations here. I mean, it's, sometimes it just seems like a model for the rest of the country because black and white know how to get along so well here, but most of the time they choose not to. Hmm. It is a complicated subject. And I'm wondering, you know, out of all of this traveling that you've done, was there any lesson that you learned that sticks with you? I mean, I think the, the lesson that I've learned from from my travels is that I find it very hard to judge people. You know, I just automatically now think, well, who would I be if I'd grown up like them? You know, let's say uh, some white guy in Mississippi comes out with, you know, some racially demeaning remark. You know, I can no longer just dismiss that person as an evil, wrong person that should be shunned. Because I think, well, what would I be like if I had, if, if my father had, you know, belong to the White Citizens Council and brought me up in a very racist environment and I'd lived here my whole life, like, would I think like that person? I guess the lesson is that we're all just, we're all just products of our environment and once you accept that about people, it becomes very hard to judge them. Sure. I don't consider myself superior to other people because of the beliefs that were instilled in me by my education and cultural background. Sure. We were we were adopted by this family on Pluto who were, you know, fairly right wing Republicans who watched Fox News all the time. And that was another lesson is that, you know, in our age of social media, people tend to define themselves as belonging to one political tribe or the other. Whereas if you're actually meeting people face to face and you're neighbors with them, you end up realizing that somebody's political views are just uh, just a small segment of who they really are i mean first and foremost uh, you know mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and sure. they've got professions and hobbies and opinions about many other topics the more i travel and the older i get the, the the less keen i am to judge somebody and i also think that the moment that you judge somebody that that's when you stop learning anything else about them yeah yeah and it's, I think that's an important lesson. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's there's so much life out there to be experienced that looking at your phone and being concerned with the opinions of others or, or the way pe- that people are judging you becomes more and more trivial. You've been through enough problems to really understand that you have no room judging anyone else. 
you know, for how they handle theirs. Yeah, and the other thing I would say was that, you know, as our world becomes more digital, more false in a way, the, 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 the more I value sensory experience. I feel like I feel like my five senses are kind of like the last honest things that I've got. <laughs> I kind of make a point of, 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 of trying to experience life through my senses as much as I can, rather than have my experience of life mediated through through technology, through somebody else's idea of what I should be experiencing, whether it's through entertainment, I just encourage myself and others to 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 to, to look hard, to, to to listen carefully, to enjoy your sense of smell, to to savor what crosses your palate. The senses are kind of all we all we got left that are honest and our own. You no, know, you just said it, but you know whether it's whether it's through economic pressure or whether it's because there's a, a sense of wanderlust and you're you're for anyone listening to this if you're moving into this idea of being a nomad um you know richard is there any sort of tip that you would give someone that is thinking about becoming a nomad i don't think it is i mean i don't think it's for everyone i mean what 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 kept me going was i've got a very active sense of curiosity curiosity and, and a kind of thirst for experience and that's really what what what's kind of kept me moving over the years, um, and and that's what that's what enabled me to put up with the, you know, I mean, there's there's hardship and poverty associated with it too. It's it's it's, it's a difficult question. It, it a lot depends how much how much money they can bring to the to the nomad game. And I mean, you're talking about living in a ratty old van, or, or are you talking about living in a $255,000 motorhome? Or I guess you can get a million dollar motorhome now. Yeah, yeah you can. Um, I mean, is, is there something regarding being open to, uh, you mentioned curiosity and that's, that's what kept yeah. you going. So maybe it's an openness of, of experience and, and wanting to be, you know, on the road and experiencing life through your senses, like you said. Yeah, I mean, I think that's how you would get most out of it. But, but you know, there's there's nomads out there that are not living that way. They 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 go around a little club and they see the same people and they they live a very re- sort of regimented lifestyle on the road and they're, they're not actually having that that much new experience. Mm, mm-hmm. it's, they, they're traveling in, in the same little group and kind of doing the same things every day mm, mm-hmm. but i mean i would uh, for me you know this is just just my my personal outlook sure that you that that, that you do need to be open to experience and the, the point of travel is to learn and expand your your knowledge to expand your horizons uh to expand your tolerance to expand your understanding of how other people live that aren't like you I mean, to to me, that's that's the whole point of the exercise. Hmm. For sure, man. Um, Richard, phenomenal conversation, my friend. Um, where can where can people find your book? More on your work. Uh, I've got a website that's richardgrant.us because I'm an American citizen now. <laughs> okay. There's there's links to my articles that you can find out about my my books there. Yeah, and people can catch the documentary. It's a really, really amazing documentary. It's called American Nomads. Thank you so much, Richard, for being here. Guys, we are going to get out of here. My name is Xavier Katana. You've been listening to The Human Experience. My guest, Richard Grant. The book is called American Nomads. You can find it online, and we will make the link for that available below. You will hear from us next week. Thank you so much for listening.